This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. We're all getting older and that has major implications for the Australian labour force. New research has been examining this in relation to the three Ps – population, participation and productivity – and the impacts of those three Ps on the economy. Population, of course, means an examination of how long we're living and also the long-term impacts of immigration on the Australian labour force – in effect, how many people are living here and working here. There's also participation in how many people are working and for how long – after all, older people might work for longer – and productivity – how effective we are economically. Peter MacDonald is a Deputy Director of the Centre of Excellence in Population Ageing Research, which is administered by the Australian School of Business in partnership with the University of Sydney and the Australian National University. So Peter, over 200,000 people emigrate to Australia every year. What sort of economic benefits do they bring? You know, the 200,000 is a net number, so there's actually more coming in because other, other people go out. And uh, they bring in a lot of different skills. The Australian program, as you know, is a skilled migration program. That's the permanent migration program. But increasingly, we've moved towards a temporary migration. It's an association between an employer and a worker, and then you can come into the country. Very efficient, actually. You can, uh, sometimes they, people come in within 24 hours. Uh, and people come in at different skill levels on, on that program because an employer wants them. Some of the other temporary categories of the uh, international students in Australia, uh, they're relatively skilled people, but they work in lower skilled jobs. Uh, the, the working holiday makers, the backpackers also are in that kind of category. They're relatively well skilled people, but they, work in, they tend to work in lower skilled jobs. New Zealanders is another category, come here uh, and they're spread right across the skill spectrum. Uh, and how about the impact on the labour force in Australia? Uh, the impact, of course, is that if we had no migration to Australia at the, the present time, zero migration, uh, the Australian labour force would be flat and, and then falling. And this is at a time when there's quite strong labour demand in Australia. And so uh, we would have a labour shortage that risks uh, wage inflation, you know, that uh, gets the economy into trouble. So migration does assist in not only providing the labour that's needed for the uh, development of Australia, and for the demand that's here now, but it also deals with the economic parameters, you know, like, like inflation. Uh, and of course we're dealing with this in terms of one of the three Ps, population and an ageing population. Many countries, Japan for example, has got almost a toppling pyramid with a large number of people who have passed retirement age, but the number of productive workers is very small indeed. How can immigration, particularly with younger skilled workers, help in Australia's case? The big impact on, on population age structure is births, in fact. Uh, and Australia's birth rate is relatively high at the moment compared to, say, Japan. But immigration does have some impact on age structure. And uh, immigrants to Australia at the present time are very young. Early 20s is kind of the average age of, of the immigrant, uh, because that includes the people who come in as international students and stay and so on, and backpackers. So the, the impact on the age structure is, is small, but, but meaningful in economic terms. Uh, but many of these people who are emigrating to Australia, either temporarily or even permanently, they're going to be highly skilled. How does that impact on the employment levels of Australians who are relatively unskilled? Mm. There's a recent uh, international study done in the United States of different countries and the impact of immigration on the wages of low-skilled workers in those countries. And there are only two countries in which the immigration uh, raised the wages of the low-skilled workers, and Australia was one of them, Singapore was the other. That's about macroeconomics, that is a skilled labour force, better growth in your, your economy, you're investing in new areas, and that uh, benefits the lower skilled workers. Uh, so the uh, effect on wages uh, is, is a positive effect in Australia's case. Uh, in terms of employment, uh, it's more of a complicated picture, I think. There's quite a, a large group of what you might call prime age males, 25 to uh, 54. Uh, about 9% are not in the labour force. And uh, it's probably true that uh, the, the, the people who come in as temporary migrants would take jobs that those people might potentially uh, get. Uh, but we have had a big, big effort to, uh, over the last decade to train, to skill up. And the number now, uh, 10 years ago, was 9%. The, the percentage today is 9%. Uh, it has achieved really nothing. And uh, I don't think it's because of the competition from migrants, because in this period, 
we've had very strong economic growth, you know, and very strong demand for labour over the last decade. But it's related to those, those particular 9% and, and their skill levels and their capacity to work. And getting them into the labour force is actually quite a difficult exercise. So over a quarter of Australians' population were born overseas. It used to be the majority came from the UK. Now that's just been slightly eclipsed by New Zealand, but they make up the majority. And then China, Italy, Greece and Germany uh, as you work your way down. What sort of impact on the labour force does having all these different cultures coming together have? Well, that's uh, that's a good question. Uh, You know, from the 1980s, we've had an open border with New Zealand. New Zealanders can come here to work. Uh, and because of the change in the, the balance between the two dollars, you know, wages in Australia are roughly 50% higher than they are in New Zealand. So in that kind of circumstance, a lot of New Zealanders are going to come to Australia to work, and they do. We have 600,000 living in Australia. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the biggest migration movements in Australia is people from the UK going to Western Australia, uh, and China and India, as you say. Uh, culturally, how does that affect uh, the country? Uh, people who migrate to Australia are actually choosing Australia. You know, they, they could migrate to Canada or they could migrate to the United States or to New Zealand or, or somewhere else. And in doing that, I think they're selective of people who are not going to want to overthrow Australian culture, as it were. You know. So you do get that gradual cultural change, but it doesn't kind of mean that uh, we're not Australia anymore, as it were. You know, it's it's, uh, Australia changes, obviously, as new people come in and as as we have contact with the rest of the world in all kinds of other ways. But it's uh, it's to me, it's not not a threatening change at all. Uh, And let's move then on to the second uh, of the three P's participation in the workforce. Does participation uh, at older ages really help in in terms of reducing our deficit and and give us economic benefits? Uh, Yes, it does. In the last decade, uh, there have been substantial increases in participation rates, labour force participation rates at older ages. The older population has a lot of skills uh, that the employers want, and they are now negotiating with employers to get the kind of package that, that uh, suits them. But is this because older workers want to work and they want something to do in their retirement or they have to work simply because they don't have a decent enough pension, they didn't put enough into their super and they've just got to have the money? Uh, a bit of both. <laughs> With the global financial crisis, uh, there are a lot of people whose uh, pension incomes uh, dropped fairly substantially. In that category, uh, people are interested in working longer to improve their retirement incomes. It is highly selective of educated people and, and professional people who are continuing to work and uh, they're people who want to keep working. You know, if you're a blue collar worker uh, then you're not continuing to work longer in those blue collar jobs. But if you're a professional you've, you've had a relatively flexible career and, and you've done lots of different things and you want to keep doing that. It's, it's hard to kind of suddenly stop doing that. And uh, so we see, prof- you know, professionals and, and professionals, and paraprofessionals, much higher proportion of the labour force as time goes by, but on a part-time basis. So we're talking about multi-skilling here. People are doing various different jobs, so it gets more interesting. So they just want to carry on working, which is very good economically yeah, for the country. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, again, more on the professional end. Uh, people have a career history where they have changed jobs and they, they are able to do it. You know, they have that kind of capability to, to change jobs. And so if they need to do that at an older age, they, they can do it. But, you know, if, you're, if you've been working in a factory or if you're a, you know, in construction, you know, a blue collar worker, uh, the story is quite different. And uh, people working in those industries do retire early on. And their health as well, because after all, if yeah. people are working in manufacturing, then it's much yeah. more physically demanding than yes, sitting yes, behind a desk. Quite, quite. You know, that the, the professional people, the educated people are in better health than those that have been in a blue-collar job. And a lot of blue-collar people have actually kind of went out of the labour force earlier on anyway because of the decline in manufacturing industry in Australia. You know, they, they haven't gone back to work. Uh, and we've seen that in a lot of manufacturing examples in Australia. And finally, let's move on to the third of the three Ps. We're talking about productivity and generating wealth for the country. We're increasingly moving to a knowledge-based economy rather than just Mm. a production line making Mm. stuff. Mm. What impact does that have on the workforce? Uh, Well, productivity is by far the most important of the determinants. You know, it's the underlying factor. The problem that Australia faces at the moment is not so much in the the, the skills and the knowledge-based industries, but in infrastructure. Uh, Our infrastructure is not good. We're inefficient in ports, we're inefficient on, in transport. We don't even have a 
a dual carriageway all the way from Sydney to Melbourne. You know, I mean, the two biggest cities in Australia, China has dual carriageways between 500 different cities. <laughs> so we are a long way behind in infrastructure. And uh, that is the factor that may hold back our productivity. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.